Thank you very much, Your Excellency, for those incredible <coughs> insights and perspectives and your vision for the future and how we can collaborate to make it a more secure and stable and prosperous region. Uh, before I start with some questions, and I'll tell you how the questions got synthesized, but I couldn't <laughs> help uh, yesterday, your team mm -hmm. came in here and started to put all these little artifacts. I know some <laughs> of the folks in the back can't see it, but uh, your Excellency, can you explain any of these artifacts that these are, are up here? These are jeepneys. <laughs> We know uh, about jeepneys. Uh, if you don't know what a jeepney is, uh, these are, these are uh, the, transport, the, the, the jeeps that were left behind by the Americans after the war, which were converted into transport, uh, transport systems. And they comprise a very large percentage of our transportation system. And the reason that we are highlighting them is because we are in the midst of an effort to go fully electric when it comes to public transport. Uh, this is our continuing effort uh, as a response, of course, to climate change to um, improve uh, the, uh, the mix of energy consumption and supply uh, from uh, the traditional fossil fuels uh, to more renewables. We have uh, uh, been uh, uh, reasonably successful. We are presently approaching 30% in terms of the energy mix, 30% renewable in terms of the energy mix uh, of, uh, of uh, the, the country's energy supply. And uh, that is why we put them out here to remind all that despite their very traditional look, they are being heavily modernized. Yes, sir. And, and I just came from the Philippines, and I have to tell you this. Yeah, these are definitely still there, and, and people are using it. So, well, thank you for that, really. And for the audience, what we have done for purposes of time is we have many folks that we've invited to, to present us with a question, and our team synthesized it. And just with the constraint of the time that we have, I understand it, sir. I'll try to ask as much as I can before we sure. have to, to terminate. I shall, but our, our, I shall try to be brief. Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Your Excellency, your comment about the critical challenges that we face out there was pretty, uh, was pretty vivid in terms of what we all face. Yeah. But you also talked about opportunities and how you seek to resolve uh, disagreements through peaceful means. Mm. So I, I was wondering if you can elaborate on this relationship. I understand you met with the Admiral Aquilino and his team today and during your time here. Perhaps share with the audience some of those initiatives that you're looking at with the United States regarding promoting be better cooperation and collaboration in the future. Well, the, the, the basic idea, of course, of all of this is that uh, the United States is our, um, I would say, our oldest uh, and most traditional partner uh, in, um, that, has been, that has been in various forms uh, ongoing for over 100 years. And uh, I think it, uh, it is, uh, serves as well to remember that the United States is the Philippines' only treaty partner. And that is why that the, with the increasing heighten, the, the heightening tension in the West Philippine Sea, as we have named it, uh, because uh, uh, it is generally known as the South China Sea, uh, the increasing tensions in the South China Sea uh, require that we partner with the, our, our allies and our friends around the world uh, so as to be able to uh, come to some kind of resolution and to maintain the peace. And as I mentioned in my remarks, uh, really what the, uh, it's the, in, uh, the foreign policy of the, of the Philippines is really rather simple. And it really comes down to two things. Number one, peace. And number two, the national interest. And in, in that sense, we have, uh, we no longer subscribe to the old uh, thinking, whereas, wherein it is a bipolar world and uh, each of the countries will choose whether to be with the Soviet Union or to be with the United States. I do not think, it is not, in my view, this is no longer applicable, uh, no longer relevant to the way the state of affairs as they have evolved uh, geopolitically. So it is important that uh, we continue to strengthen that partnership. And the main partner is of, of the Philippines is, of course, the United States. But starting with that, uh, we also feel that it is the, the way forward is to strengthen our partnerships 
in all, uh, with, with all our neighbors and with all our friendly, with all friendly nations who share our ideals, who share our aspirations, who share our values and the respect for the international rule of law. And this has been something that we have tried to develop and uh, we have, uh, I believe, uh, uh, have, have had some uh, a measure of success and we will continue to do this. But again, the bedrock of any of these partnerships is the partnership and the treaty arrangement that we have, the mutual defense treaty that we have with the United States. And in that regard, we are continuing to uh, increase our uh, capabilities so as to be able to answer the challenges that, uh, that we are facing uh, every, well now it's becoming more and more often. Uh, every so often, whenever there is a confrontation between outside forces and Philippine forces. Uh, this is uh, unfortunately, uh, as I have uh, said uh, to some of our partners, uh, unfortunately I cannot report that uh, the situation is improving. The situation has become more dire than it was before. The, uh, the nearest reefs uh, that uh, uh, the PLA have started to show interest in, uh, in, in, in terms of uh, slowly uh, using these atolls, these shoals, as a basis for building, uh, basis really is what, the, is what they are, are approaching, the, have, have come closer and closer to the Philippine coastline. And the nearest one is now around 60 nautical miles from the nearest Philippine coast. And this, uh, this is an evolving situation. Uh, if you will remember, the Spratly Islands was used by the American, uh, by the U.S. Navy, as a uh, um, as a bombing range for a very long time, and so that the, there was no there was no question that this was part of the Philippines. Now they have fallen into the hands of a foreign power, and many of these features uh, that are that are in the West Philippine Sea are slowly. Uh, being turned into bases, really. Uh, the uh, uh, Admiral uh, Aquilino just showed me a uh, relief sort of uh, map, not, not, not map, but model uh, of one of them. And the, it is remarkable the extent, the ex how the extensive uh, construction and the level of uh, uh, commitment that has been made to those uh, military bases. And so it's not, uh, it, is, it is something that we, that in our view, uh, of course the United States once again is the bedrock, is a, the foundation for all that. But the more allies we find to speak up uh, whenever such uh, incursions are, occur, such incidents or events occur, uh, then I think the stronger that voice will be. And so we, we have encouraged that uh, to a great deal. The United States, of course, has been there. Uh, and in every instance where we have had trouble, uh, the U.S. has always been behind us in terms of support, uh, not only in terms of rhetoric, but also in terms of concrete support. Uh, and, but that, is also, that also applies now to Australia, to Same. South Korea, to Japan. We are now in the midst of uh, uh, negotiating our own code of conduct, for example, with Vietnam, because we are still waiting for the code of conduct between China and, the, and Asia. And the progress has been rather slow, unfortunately. And so we've taken the initiative to, to approach those other countries around Asia with whom we have existing territorial conflicts, Vietnam being one of them, Malaysia being another and to, uh, to make our own code of, code of conduct, and hopefully this will, be, uh, uh, this will grow further and extend into the other ASEAN countries. And at the very least, we have that basis between uh, not only in the multilateral sphere, as in ASEAN, or APEC, all of these other organizations, but also bilaterally with the different countries uh, that uh, around ASEAN who we have, who we have uh, conflicts with, but uh, whom I think we can, uh, uh, we can find a way to
to maintain the status quo and certainly the most primordial concern is to maintain the peace. Thank you, Mr. President. I, when I listened to you and, and how you repeated actually some of the key tenets of what you were saying in your speech, I remember just the recent visit I had in Manila mm -hmm. and speaking to not just General Browner, but your Secretary of Defense, Teodoro, and others. That is a consistent message of your firm res uh, resolve to work things peacefully, but to work with the United States and other like-minded partners mm -hmm. around the region, particularly in Southeast Asia. I would also offer you, when you talked about the rules based order, international order, and how you've got the, the favorable findings from the Tribunal oh, oh. Court of uh, Arbitration in 2016, mm -hmm. that all underscores what we are all trying to do, which is to maintain that peace and prosperity, but following the rules based international order. Now, you mentioned something in your speech, and you covered it quickly, but I think every country is wrestling with it in terms of technology, mm -hmm. emerging technology. H how do you view that strategically? How can you leverage technology in terms of building an enhancing relationship and cooperation with other countries? Well, I, I think it, it, it applies uh, to essentially every sector. Uh, one of uh, the great events uh, in the recent past has been COVID. And COVID showed us, showed us a new way of doing everything. Uh, it showed us a new way of living, a new way of working, a new way of interacting with one another, a new way of living. And that has been brought about, that, that those solutions have been brought about by technology. So if we go to, a, to a, another sector, uh, which applies to every other single sector that we ever discuss in government, and that's climate change. Climate change was brought about by burgeoning technologies, which we did not realize mm. were going to uh, uh, poison the planet to this extent um, over 200 years or so. Uh, but then we also looked to technology to, be the, to bring us the solutions mm. uh, in this, in, for this, uh, this, pr this existential challenge that we are all facing. So let's bring it back now to the, the question of security. Again, technology, I think, will provide many of the solutions. But of course, at the very beginning of all that is the resolve of each country in partnership with other countries to continue to maintain the rule of law mm. and to do that in the interest of peace. Mm -hmm. And that is what we have been trying to promote. And I do believe, I am very encouraged by the discussions that we have had, not only with the U.S., but with other countries, that this, uh, it, it is well understood that this is, in fact, the way forward, that we must, con we must uh, co collaborate uh, to bring those technologies to, to the fore uh, so that we, our people can, uh, can reap the advantages of that. Now, the latest... Uh, uh, the latest technology that everyone, of course, is looking to, as it is exceedingly powerful, is AI. Uh, and we uh, uh, have just received the news uh, that uh, there has been, within the AI community, this conflict as to whether or how far to push it without regulation. I know, I know President Biden has just signed a document that uh, says that this must be regulated, monitored, and regulated properly. Because we have seen the uh, rather more sinister uses of, uh, of uh, artificial technology. On the other hand, uh, we must always remember it is a double-edged sword, and it can swing in a way that will help us. And I think the if uh, we are trying to, as we are trying to transform our economy in the Philippines, as we all are, as a matter of fact, after COVID, uh, in the face of Ukraine, and now in the Middle East, uh, we, we have, uh, we, we have uh, tried to bring these new technologies into, uh, into the fore. But once again, we have to be more cognizant of uh, what are the risks involved. And the reason that it is so difficult is because these things never existed before in human history. And we are making this up as we go, go along, as it were. And there are very many unintended consequences to something quite so powerful. Once again, just look at the Industrial Revolution. There was no way that uh, when the Victorians started uh, the, um, 
the Industrial Revolution that they would say 200 years down the road, we are going to have to think about global warming. We're going to have to think about melting the ice in uh, the poles. Uh, so we have to be extremely careful. And also because technology has evolved so rapidly. And that is another reason that we have to pay a good deal of attention to it. Because uh, it can easily, we will easily be left behind. If we rest on our laurels and say we've got this figured out, that is the moment that we get into trouble. And so we continue to look to the United States and to technology leaders like the United States to provide uh, the guidance and to the lessons, rather, that uh, you have learned being at the forefront, uh, and the, both the good lessons and the lessons that were not quite as successful, and hopefully apply that uh, in the Philippines. And I'm, uh, again, uh, with, with the discussions that we have had with the U.S. and with other countries as well, I, I feel confident that so long as we are, we are aware that there is a possible danger and we think things through properly, then we will be able to take full advantage of AI and of other new technologies. On the other hand, if we sit back and just let it take over our lives, that is exactly what it will do. It will take over our lives. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm, I'm pressed for time, but I need to ask oh. this because I hear, I heard you say ASEAN. I know the Philippines is a founding mm. uh, member of ASEAN, and I think in uh, 2026, you will assume the, the position of chair. Right. Yes. Uh, we all know in the audience regarding uh, what happened in Myanmar mm -hmm. and how the juntas had really, uh, their actions in Myanmar really undermined the centrality and just the basic understanding between the ASEAN countries. Uh, it may be uh, too far ahead to ask in terms of in your role as the ASEAN chair, but what, was, what were you thinking as the leader of the Philippines to be looking to help ASEAN grow into uh, an adaptive role, in, particularly in terms of what has happened in the region that kind of destabilized it? Well, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of Myanmar, it has really been a, uh, uh, a difficult problem for the, for the whole of ASEAN. Uh, for, one, for one thing, uh, the, there are different conditions. Uh, for example, Myanmar, when there's fighting in Myanmar, the refugees cross over into they cross over the 2,000-mile border that Thailand has with Myanmar, and uh, they have that particular problem. Then there are Islamic countries uh, in, our, in, in, in ASEAN who also have an interest because of uh, the persecution that is being seen uh, on the Muslim communities in Myanmar. The general, the general um, approach uh, until quite recently has been to write down the five points of consensus as we have for ASEAN. Everyone has signed off on it. In fact, even Myanmar has signed off on it. Um, and continue to work with the, uh, with the national, with the leadership and uh, also the, uh, the opposition to that leadership uh, so as to have some kind of a balanced discussion. Unfortunately, we really have to admit that we have not made very much progress even since, since the writing of the five points of consensus uh, that ASEAN has uh, agreed upon. So there has been a, a significant shift uh, that really occurred in the last, in the, in the last ASEAN in the chairman, under the chairmanship of Indonesia where it became very clear, and upon the urging actually of Han Seng of Cambodia, uh, and his, uh, his, uh, uh, his uh, argument went this, like this. And I said, and he says that there have, uh, when, I was, when I became leader, they, nobody wanted to talk to me because uh, I was not uh, regarded or recognized as the leader. And he says, but who else will they talk to? And so, now they spoke to me and we have found a way to work. The different countries around have found a way to work. And this is the same situation as in Myanmar. Uh, if you insist on only handling these issues at a very high level, which is what the principle was in the beginning, uh, that we only talk government to government, ASEAN to government, 
And unless, they re unless there's progress made on that front, then there is no progress made. So the shift, is, the shift has come. And we now, uh, under the informal auspices of, uh, of ASEAN, uh, each country is allowed to make approaches to the Myanmar leadership and the opposition, all the stakeholders in Myanmar, to try and find a solution to the problems that, uh, that, are, being, that are being faced. And as in any conflict, the, the, the humanitarian side of it, the humanitarian uh, 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 cost has grown exponentially over the past two, three years. And, and so that just makes, the, that just makes the, the situation even more urgent than it was before. So we have encouraged a slightly different approach. The Philippines is playing its part, and we, are, we have an interest in the Myanmar conflict for the simple reason that the, it affects the Philippines as well. And in terms, not in terms of actual fighting or refugees, but in terms of things like human trafficking. Uh, we have had to rescue many of our nationals from Myanmar and bring them back to the Philippines as they were human traffic. They, was, they, they had been trafficked to, uh, to work in usually uh, illegal, uh, illegal activities. Uh, so there is a great deal of, of impetus for ASEAN to solve this problem. But it is a very, very difficult problem as it has involved other players, and it's not just the leadership in Myanmar. One of the most disturbing analyses that we have seen is that actually the military junta has lost, uh, has lost support from its own military, mm. and it only carries on with uh, their, uh, their uh, militaristic uh, and really terroristic activities by air power. And that air power has been provided not by, uh, not, not by Myanmar itself, but from uh, foreign countries. And uh, that, is, so that, that is why I propose, I said, maybe it's time to talk to those who are supplying the arms or those who are supplying the airplanes and the bombs and to say that uh, we have to find a way to bring a hiatus, at least a hiatus to this, to try and do something about the humanitarian problem. And then perhaps that will be a first step. And once we are discussing that, and once we are more active and allowed to operate more within the country, and to have more contact and more communication, perhaps that will lead to something else. And so that, is, uh, that, that presently is the state. Uh, of affairs when it, uh, from, for ASEAN when it comes to Myanmar. Uh, when, the, when the chair comes to the Philippines, or when the ASEAN chair comes to the Philippines, this is, this is still what we intend to promote within uh, our neighboring countries. And uh, to find a way, I, 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 always, I always quote, uh, I, I'm a great believer that you should try everything everywhere all the time. Uh, simply because you cannot predict by any stretch of the imagination where it will succeed. And my best example is always who would have thought that diplomatic relations between the U.S. and China would come about because of table tennis. But it did. <laughs> and so let's try everything. Let's try, let's talk to our, 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 our friends, uh, our, perhaps our adversaries, but try everything. And that is what we will try to promote. We are, we are not, uh, we are, uh, we are perfectly aware of the history of such negotiations. And, uh, for example, the peace treaty that was, in fact, signed in Oslo that was unofficial between, uh, in the Middle East, and again the Chinese US, China U.S. And it, there are many examples of this. And that's why I, I uh, when the chair comes to the Philippines. We will once again remind our partners and say that we should not be too picky about how we get in touch or how we communicate with the, uh, with the military leadership in Myanmar on how we negotiate and how we discuss with the other stakeholders. Uh, because it's not just the political opposition. Unfortunately, 
both sides in this conflict, both the military junta and the opposition, politically, the political opposition have grown, have taken on a very, very hard line. And they will not speak to one another. And perhaps that's the role that ASEAN can play, is to come in between the two, the two parts and hopefully, hopefully bring them together, if not totally, but at least in certain ways. And move, start the process, start the process. Uh, the, the, there is no process as yet. Start the process and hopefully uh, it will bring a uh, more equitable and peaceful uh, situation in Myanmar uh, to the benefit of all of us in ASEAN and all of Asia for that matter. Well, Your Excellency, your, your insights, I must say, is very refreshing mm -hmm. and encourages all of us to work harder to, to collaborate to, to this vision that you've laid out. And I truly think we must try everything. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give, help me and give a round of applause, <laughs> Mr. President. And sir, uh, before we conclude the speaker series, I understand you have a special presentation to the state of Hawaii. Yes. And if I can ask Lieutenant Governor uh, Sylvia Luke to come up, as well as Congressman Case, Congresswoman Takuda, Senator Aquino, and Senator De La Cruz, please come up and join. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you very much. The eight August 2023 wildfires affected various areas in Maui, particularly the historic town of Lahaina. In a spirit of unity and compassion, President Marcos instructed relevant agencies to collaborate with the state of Hawaii to assist grieving families and help affected communities rebuild. With this humble donation, the Philippines stands in solidarity with the state of Hawaii and continues to pray and hope for the full recovery of Maui as it embarks on a rebuilding the island. Madam Governor, thank you. It's just a simple donation to help uh, all our friends. And, uh, we have already made efforts to, to uh, provide support to our Philippine nationals in, in Maui, but again, uh, in uh, solidarity with the state of Hawaii, we thought we would Thank you. Thank you. Please Thank be you. seated. Please be seated.